very much. And that concludes our statement. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions on environment, climate change and land reform. Our first question is from David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available to businesses that are committed to lowering carbon emissions and improving air quality. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Our Green New Deal will deliver billions of investment in our net zero future and position Scotland to take advantage of a green economy. We're taking action to optimise existing support so that Scotland's energy intensive industrial sites are better positioned to access funding opportunities that will help them to deliver emissions savings whilst remaining internationally competitive. And we're also providing practical and financial support to local authorities in tackling local air pollution hotspots. This includes a total of £4.5 million uh, in annual funding. David Torrance. Cabinet Secretary, I've met with several local businesses who are keen to convert their fleets to electric or hydrogen. A common concern was the challenge of balancing the investment in new technology and effective and sustainable operational performances with a desire to commit to a clean energy future. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what role the Scottish Government can play in assisting this transition? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government does offer interest-free loan funding for businesses and consumers to purchase ultra-low emission vehicles through the Electric Vehicle Loan Scheme delivered by the Energy Saving Trust. We have also invested around £30 million to increase publicly available charging to over 1,200 charge points on the Charge Place Scotland network. Question number two, Liam Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is on track to meet net zero emissions by 2045. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scotland is almost halfway to achieving net zero with a 47% reduction in emissions between 1990 and 2017. And this strong progress is recognised in the recent report from the Committee on Climate Change. In line with that report, we also recognise that more will need to be done to reach net zero by 2045. And that is why we are currently updating our climate change plan to reflect the new targets. The committee's advice for the UK government is also clear. They must step up and match Scottish policy ambition in areas where key powers are reserved. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. But the Committee on Climate Change report published in December criticised the SNP government for lagging behind both England and Wales on designing a future farm funding system that encourages environmentally friendly farming. It identifies this as an area where the policy levers exist here at Holyrood and urgent action is required to meet the 2045 target. Can the Cabinet ex Secretary explain what's taking so long? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for his uh, question and I note that my colleague, who is the actual Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, has now uh, left the chamber. I can tell the member, however, um, that I have a number of conversations uh, with Fergus Ewing, including this week, uh, about uh, the extent to which uh, agriculture is going to have to contribute to achieving net zero by 2045. Um, as the member may have heard, the First Minister say there was a cabinet discussion on Tuesday um, about the overall issue uh, in terms of Scotland uh, achieving 2045 net zero. Um, and that includes the range of actions right across uh, everything that's contained within the climate change plan. And of course, that does include agriculture. Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber what assurances the Scottish Government has received from the UK Government that in the key areas that it has responsibility for, such as carbon storage, uh, carbon capture and storage, decarbonisation of the grid and increasing the pace of vehicle transition, it will take action in the coming year to ensure Scotland can meet the 2045 target? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can advise that in spite of having written on multiple occasions to call for action in the many specific reserved areas flagged up by the Committee on Climate Change, uh, it is a pity that we have received no substantive assurances whatsoever from the UK. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the Scottish Government's very slow progress on decarbonising heat to date and Citizen Advice Scotland's recent call for greater investment and action on tackling heat emissions, what new action will the Scottish Government take to tackle emissions from heat to help Scotland reach net zero? I'm sure the uh, member will have listened to my earlier uh, responses. We are currently in the process of doing the very quick revisal, the update to the existing climate change plan. Uh, the question of uh, heat decarbonisation is a key one that will need to be addressed and we're looking at the potential for actions, but it is also one of the key ones 
where action from the UK government will be required if we are going to be able to achieve what we need to achieve in order to get to net zero by 2045. Um, and uh, uh, people really need to go and have a look at the detail of what the UK Committee for Climate Change flagged up as the division between devolved and reserved requirements in this respect, because it is a real issue for us achieving our net zero targets. Mark Roscoe. Thanks. Um, last night's challenging George Monbiot documentary on Channel 4 emphasised the scale of the changes that may be needed globally for our food production in order to meet net zero targets. Now, although there will be those who are threatened um, by that message, on the week that uh, Greg's state, vegan steak bakes arrived in the shelves in Scotland, what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that we're capturing the economic and the environmental opportunities that are being driven by consumer demand for reduced meat diets? Can I thank the member for inadvertently having given me some advance notice of the supplementary that he was going to ask. Um, I did not actually see the programme to which he refers. I am, however, conscious of the debate that is taking place. Um, there are a couple of things I should say, in addition to what I've already said in respect of agriculture, which I won't repeat. And that is that, uh, yes, there is a global challenge. Um, there is a difficulty, however, uh, however if we try to uh, uh, attach global solutions to local conditions. Situation in Scotland, particularly when it comes to livestock uh, production, is very, very different indeed. Uh, and I know that the member understands that because we've already had a bit of that conversation. It is something which uh, my colleague Fergus Ewing is looking at very carefully and we're very conscious of the need to deal with the issue of agriculture uh, emissions, but we need to do that in a fair way that recognises uh, the future for that industry uh, and the likely continued future for that industry. Um, dietary changes uh, are always to be welcome, particularly when it comes to increasing fruit and veg intake, presiding officer, which is a health issue as well um, as a, a climate change issue. Um, but uh, uh, we do need to do so within the context of the existing Scottish agricultural system and not presume that what we see globally in terms of mistakes being made are being repeated in Scotland because they're not. Question number three, Maurice Curry. Thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to maximise the Crown Estate's coastal assets, including enhancing the opportunities for marine sport and tourism activities. Cabinet Secretary. Crown Estate Scotland's draft corporate plan 2020 to 2023 includes a proposal for a coastal asset strategy. This will seek to maximise the potential of their coastal assets through their efficient management and development. And the draft corporate plan also sets out options for Crown Estate Scotland investment, including in supporting the growth of Scotland's blue economy. Uh, activity over the coming years will include a focus on marine tourism, including potentially marine sport activities and on uh, helping coastal communities to manage their local marine resources. Maurice Corey. Thank you, uh, Sorry, officer. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. Uh, a sailing tourism in Scotland report states that Scotland's £130 million sailing tourism economy is set to grow by as much as 28% in the next seven years and identifies further opportunities for private and public investment in critical infrastructural developments to meet growing demand. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline today what the government is doing to encourage further growth and development of specific assets like the Rue Marina in Rue in the Firth of Clyde area? I'm aware of the member's interest in the uh, Rue Marina, uh, Helensburgh. I think he's already um, uh, um, been uh, um, active in that regard since, uh, uh, since Crown Estate Scotland has taken over. They've worked with Rue Marina on a number of improvement works. The Marina was recently awarded for gold anchors by the Yacht Harbour Association. So there is some uh, considerable uh, progress taking place there in the more general sense. Um, uh, uh, clearly, um, the issue of Scotland's coasts and waters is uh, something which uh, uh, we want. And I know uh, other colleagues uh, of both the members and uh, in other parts of this chamber uh, are very keen to uh, continue um, to push for development of uh, Scotland's marine environment and the potential for development. But of course, there are some issues in there that do need to be addressed in terms of how we balance those two things. Uh, and then this does, of course, allow me to uh, take the opportunity to put out a big uh, advert to Scotland's Year of Coasts and Waters, which, of course, is 2020. And I expect will be a another big 
uh, signifier for increasing marine tourism in Scotland. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presenting officer, to ask the Scottish Government what flood prevention action will take place following the completion of the Inverclyde Integrated Catchment Study. The Integrated Catchment Study will provide detailed information regarding flooding mechanisms from overland flow, sewers and watercourses. Once the study is complete, responsible authorities will be in a position to consider what actions should be taken to manage flood risk in Inverclyde. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and the Cabinet Secretary will be very much aware of uh, my interest in the issue of flooding in Inverclyde and the Cabinet Secretary visited Inverclyde a number of years ago. The study will be hugely beneficial for infrastructure planning in Inverclyde for many years to come and it's important that the study uh, is maintained for that going forward as well. But can the Cabinet Secretary, however, provide an, an update on the funding for flood prevention infrastructure that has been provided to Inverclyde Council since 2007 and also what has been requested from Inverclyde Council for the remainder of this parliamentary session. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, well, I need to remind the Chamber uh, of the way we do um, uh, flood funding in Scotland. In 2016, we agreed a 10-year flood funding strategy with COSLA, which is funded from the local authority capital settlement and amounts to a minimum of £42 million per year. 80% of this annual uh, funding supports delivery of the flood protection schemes identified in the flood risk strategies that were published by SEPA in 2015. Four of these schemes are within Inverclyde and the Council has received all the required funding from the Scottish Government to take forward these schemes. The remaining 20% of funding is distribu distributed annually amongst all Scottish local authorities based on their share of properties at risk of flooding. Since 2007, the Scottish Government has provided Inverclyde Council with £2.9 million from the Local Authority Capital Settlement to support delivery of flood protection schemes within Inverclyde, and that's the four that I was uh, referring uh, to earlier. Um, future uh, funding will depend on uh, what schemes uh, are, are taken forward um, and what priorities they are given. Finlay Carson. The Secretary will be aware that back in November I raised the worrying issue that four years on from the flooding that devastated Newton Stewart, we're still awaiting a much needed flood protection scheme. Can the Cabinet Secretary give us an update on any discussion she's had with Dumfries and Galloway Council uh, and outline what, her, what role she could have in playing to ensure a scheme can be delivered as a matter of urgency because I understand that a flood uh, order has been uh, waiting to be published since the summer. Cabinet Secretary. I think um, uh, it would be helpful, I think, if the, if the member was to speak to me directly about the very specifics of that. In the general sense, it is for local authorities um, to, to be the ones to bring forward the schemes. The, uh, um, the, the, you know, I, I, I don't kind of micromanage this. Um, and if there is a very particular issue in terms of what seems perhaps to be a, a bit of a bureaucratic blockage, then I'm happy to engage with the minister on the specifics around that. Thank you. Question number five, Willie Coffey. Government, how it plans to uphold environmental standards in Scotland when the UK leaves the European Union. Cabinet Secretary. We are committed to maintain or exceed EU environmental standards, whatever the outcome of Brexit. Uh, despite the three years of uncertainty, we have been working to ensure that the four key environmental principles continue to sit at the heart of policy making and law in Scotland and intend to legislate for domestic governance arrangements. An announcement will be made before the new continuity bill is introduced. Lily Coffey. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. The original withdrawal agreement contained a commitment to maintain environmental protections, but that has now been removed, as I understand it. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is appalling, given the current climate crisis, that the UK Government wants to move away from the standards and protections for our environment that are offered by European Union regulation? It is clear that uh, in the face of the twin global crisis of climate uh, and biodiversity, we should be increasing our efforts and working more closely with other countries, not loosening our ties and turning back the clock on environmental protections. So it does appear to me to be inexplicable that the UK government appears to be moving uh, in this direction. I hope this apparent movement turns out not to be the case, but it is a worrying development. There is no doubt about that. We will, of course, resist any moves which would lessen our freedom to maintain and strengthen our environmental protections in Scotland. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. And uh, continuing on that theme, reflecting what an SNP policy commitment to Greenpeace was as part of the UK election, will the Scottish Government set, I quote, legally binding long-term and interim targets to clean up our air, soils, seas and rivers 
and enshrine a commitment to develop policies that will reduce Scotland's global environmental footprint and restore nature in Scotland, particularly important in the, um, in the present circumstances. Well, we are working very, very hard indeed um, to, to take that work forward. We're uh, at the moment, as the member knows, we are uh, in the business, as I indicated, of ensuring that the environmental principles are statutorily uh, based. We're looking at environmental governance uh, uh, for this year. We are uh, currently, uh, as we've only just been given sight of the UK government's environment bill uh, and some of the implications there for uh, devolved matters, we're having to look very carefully at what the implications of that are. Uh, uh, but I think the member knows that uh, uh, it is my uh, full intention, as I indicated earlier, um, that what we do uh, will not just reflect the EU uh, as it's currently uh, standing in terms of its protections, continue to do so uh, uh, as the EU improves, uh, but also to look where we can go further and better uh, even than that. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and can I refer members to my register of interest as a member of the League Against Cruel Sports to ask the Scottish Government whether the timetable for its proposed legislation in fox hunting allows sufficient time for it to be passed within the current parliamentary session. Minister Mary Cujon. Yes. Colin Smith. I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, sorry, the Minister very much for that answer. Um, it is obviously exactly a year since the Minister did say she would bring forward a bill during the course of the current parliamentary session, so I welcome the commitment reinforced again today. So can the Minister tell us, therefore, given the length of time it takes to pass legislation and the fact that we do only have 18 months left in the current parliamentary session, when exactly she'll publish the pre-legislation consultation and then when exactly will she publish the bill uh, and bring it forward to Parliament. And can you give a clear commitment to the people of Scotland that Boxing Day 2019 will be the last tally ho for fox hunting and this cruel practice will be consigned to the history books where it belongs? Minister. No, I, I thank the member for that question and I completely understand I've, I've met with, uh, with Colin Smith as well as other members to discuss the proposals uh, that I had announced in January last year. But I hope that he could understand as well as other members across the chamber that we set out our planned legislative timetable in the programme for government. And, uh, but subject to the content of the year five legislative programme being agreed to and to parliamentary timetable and timetabling an extensive and wide reaching impact of Brexit, we need to see how that pans out but there is still th those are still very much our plans to bring forward uh, a, a bill and we do have the sufficient time in hand out with all of those other issues uh, to progress that and we will bring forward our proposals and consult on those proposals in due course. Rona Mackay. Sir to ask the Scottish Government what impact the animal and wild wildlife bill will have once passed on the penalties for those who commit animal welfare offences uh, including fox hunting. Mary Gujon, Minister. If passed, our animal and wildlife bill will increase the maximum penalties for existing serious domestic animal and wildlife offences, and that includes offences against foxes, and it will increase those penalties to a potentially unlimited fine and five years imprisonment. And uh, also, very importantly as part of that, it increases the statutory time limit on wildlife crime offences, and that essentially allows Police Scotland more time to investigate, gather evidence and undertake forensic tests. Increasing the statutory time limit was one of the recommendations that had been made by Lord Bonamy in his review of the Protection of Wild Mammals Act, and that's a, a key aspect of the proposals that we're putting forward. Thank you. Question seven, Sandra White. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. To answer the Scottish Government when it last met representative SEPA and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. I met with the SEPA board on 26 November 2019 to discuss priorities for the future, including tackling the global climate emergency. My officials regularly meet with SEPA on a variety of different issues. Andrew White. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Can I draw the Minister's or the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, attention to the current uh, situation of the River Clyde? Uh, would the Minister agree that an essential clean-up is required for the River Clyde? As Glasgow will be host to many events this year, most notably the COP26, will the Minister seek assurances from SEPA that the River Clyde will be assessed and that those responsible will be obliged to act on that assessment. Uh, the Clyde needs a long-term strategy to ensure the maintenance of the river and the surrounding areas. Secretary. The government is, of course, looking forward to playing a central role in leading and driving ambition at COP26. We are leading the UK on tackling the climate emergency and that should be celebrated. On the specifics of the question, monitoring and long-term investment in improving the Clyde is ongoing. 
River Clyde water quality has improved significantly since 2017 thanks to the cooperation of multiple stakeholders including Scottish Water, SEPA and local authorities and the Clyde is now classified as good in a number of aspects. Between 2010 and 2021, Scottish Water will have invested £610 million in its wastewater assets to ensure that sewage is treated properly before it's discharged into the Clyde. Scottish Water is also investing £15 million to improve the River Kelvin, which is a tributary of the Clyde. Keep Scotland Beautiful has established upstream, the Upstream Battle Project, which aims to educate communities and support cleanups in the Clyde Valley and increase awareness of the harmful impact of litter. And the ultimate goal of that project is to stop litter from getting into the Clyde. The Scottish Government is one of a number of funders and has uh, provided £30,000 to the project. More widely, the Scottish Government's Water Environment Fund, which is administered by SEPA, has helped restore natural habitats by removing fish barriers and concrete channels to allow fish to reach the upper reaches of the Clyde catchment. And that fund has invested three million pounds in river restoration projects near Hamilton and Shots. If there are specific issues that are of concern to the member, I'm sure SEPA would be happy to discuss these with her directly. Thank you. Question eight, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect open ground habitats, such as peatlands and grasslands, which are critical to the conservation of Cardiff. We are using a range of measures to protect the habitat of open ground bird species such as the curlew. These include the protection of suitable habitat within Scotland's statutory protected areas, as well as the management of habitats under the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme, with £31 million committed for wader management under the scheme to date. I'm also pleased to note the very recent award by uh, SNH of more than £156,000 to Curlews in Crisis Scotland under the Scottish Government's Biodiversity Challenge Fund to help increase suitable breeding areas and reduce predation at sites in Caithness and Ayrshire. This will play a crucial role in our efforts to improve nature and help Scotland meet its international biodiversity uh, um, commitments. And I believe that Lewis MacDonald may be a species champion for the curlew. <laughs> in, in, indeed, and, and therefore I do welcome that award, uh, which uh, the Cabinet Secretary will recall uh, I pressed her to uh, support uh, on a previous occasion. She will also recognise the need to balance new forest planting to sequester carbon with the need to protect uh, species and habitats uh, such as the curlew uh, in order to support biodiversity. Will she therefore authorise a spatial mapping assessment to guide future forestry planting decisions? and to protect safe breeding habitats in the future. I, I think the member is probably aware that it was, would not be for me to make that uh, decision. It would be for my colleague, uh, the uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, more correctly, the Cabinet Secretary for Forestry. I will raise that directly with him. I, I think the, the, the member is raising a very legitimate point, which is uh, for us to understand over a range of different issues um, uh, the balances and consequences that uh, uh, might arise. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we need to grow more trees. We need there to be uh, uh, increased uh, carbon capture through uh, green infrastructure like uh, tree planting. But of course, we've also got to think about the consequences for biodiversity and all of that. Some of the work that we do has immensely positive biodiversity impacts, such as peatland restoration. Forest planting does have a, a, a slightly different issue to address. Um, and I will ensure that my colleague Fergus Ewing um, does have uh, um, uh, the member's concern in, in front of them. Um, there is um, survey work and environmental information required already under the forestry grant scheme. Um, uh, the member seems to be asking for something more strategic and widespread, uh, and I will ensure that that is brought to my colleague's attention. Thank you very much, and that concludes portfolio questions.